So I can be found most Saturdays preaching in the chapel in the, in the late afternoon, early evening. And, and I realized this hasn't been that long ago that there are actually people who've been in this church for quite a while that they know there's a chapel, but they really don't know where it is. <laughs> it's right out here. If you've never seen it, you need to go check out this building. It is, it is uh, holy and wonderful. But anyway, that's where I'm at uh, most Saturdays. And um, for the season of Lent during Saturday worship, we're using Reverend Dr. Williman's book, Fear of the Other. And today I'm touching on the fourth chapter of his book entitled Loving the Other in Church. So just briefly, Dr. Williman is a professor at Duke University Divinity School. He's a retired United Methodist Bishop, and he's authored more than 60 books with over a million copies sold. So this book, Fear of the Other, this book and this sermon series uh, during the season of Lent has really, really been challenging. I like being challenged when I write a sermon, but it seems like with every week it becomes more and more challenging. And this week, uh, I was challenged in a different kind of way. It kind of surprised me. I, this week I found myself with a differing opinion to the book, to the author. And initially I found myself pushing back. I, I, what's the problem with having a differing opinion? I mean, I can't, I can't remember the last faith-related book that I read where I agreed with everything cover to cover, and that's fine, right? So what's different this time? Why the hesitation to disagree? Well, I am a United Methodist pastor, and Dr. Williman is a retired United Methodist bishop. And Dr. Williman is a professor at a prestigious United Methodist Seminary. And Dr. Williman is the author of 60 books. He's somebody. He's a United Methodist somebody. And so maybe it's only a pastor who would care about that, but it felt presumptuous to me to disagree or at least not be fully on board. And so I finally decided, you know, it's okay to not be fully on board initially, as long as I remain fully open to what Dr. Williman is saying, and more importantly, remain open to the Holy Spirit. So, our scripture today is taken directly from this chapter. It is short and sweet. It's the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, and I invite you to please stand out of respect for the Gospel. I give you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, when you love each other. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So why do people come to church? Why do you come to worship on the weekend? I mean, think about that for a moment. I mean, certainly worship is a primary spiritual practice and it is really good that you are here for a whole lot of reasons it's really good you're here but what difference does this make to you make in your life you know what do you hope to gain from being here in 2018 why do people come to church why do people come to worship on the weekend well some of you probably grew up in church you probably were in church before you were even developing memory. And for you to not be in church on the weekend feels weird. Being in church every weekend for you is like breathing in and breathing out. However, in 2018, there are fewer and fewer young adults, meaning adults, people moving into those adult years, who, who actually did grow up in the church being there every week, in Sunday school or in worship. And for those who didn't actually grow up that way in the church uh, attending every week, well, for some Christians, church may be a very occasional thing, like, like Christmas Eve and Easter. And that's how I grew up. That's how I grew up. My family belonged to a church, and I was baptized as an infant, and I was confirmed in seventh grade because that's what you do. And beyond that, my family attended every Christmas Eve and most Easter's and a smattering of time in between. And the smattering of time in between was just uncomfortable. 
Because when you're not in church on a fairly regular basis, it really feels fairly foreign. I grew up in central Iowa. We, we were in a college town. Population of 50,000, counting the college students, which the folks in that town like to do. <laughs> Compared to most towns in Iowa, that's pretty big. It is. I mean, it's probably hard to imagine here, but that's pretty big. And even when, whether you counted the college students or not. And because it was a college town, it was, you know, pretty forward thinking. And everybody I knew as a kid, everybody, with the rarest exception, everybody I knew growing up belonged to a church. Everybody did. I was growing up in the 60s to like the late 70s. And, and this, this was just one of the questions kids would ask when they were meeting each other for the first time. It wouldn't be the first question you asked, but it would be one of the set, you know, when you were meeting somebody. And it was, what church do you go to? I mean, everybody asked that question. And there was just this assumption that you'd have an answer. And pretty much everybody did. And, and with kids anyway, very often it, it wasn't like a, a question about religious beliefs or anything like that. It was more a question of, well, who do you know that I might know because you go to a particular church? It was kind of more of a, a social thing, getting to know each other. <laughs> but this is not the 60s and 70s anymore. We're a long ways from that. This is 2018. Here at Manchester United Methodist Church, we have more than 3,000 members on our rolls with about a third of that number in worship on the weekend. And the thing is, that is not uncommon. In mainline Protestant denominations, that is not uncommon. That is a whole lot of belonging to the church the way my family did growing up. And it kind of feels like the last gym membership I had. I started out so enthusiastic. <laughs> I bought all the right clothes. I had the very best intentions, and I was absolutely faithful for a while. But life gets busy, you know? And after a while, well, I found I wasn't going at all. I found I wasn't even thinking about it. But to give up the gym membership, well, I didn't want to do that because that feels like giving up, right? Because someday I'll have time and someday I'll make a habit out of the gym. And as long as I remain a member, there's a connection. There's hope, right? And the reason I bring all of this up is Willimon's book, Fear of the Other. I know most of you have not read this book, and that's okay. You ought to be able to follow along just fine. The sense I get in this particular chapter of the book is that the author is actually very frustrated and letting off some steam. And if you think about it, Dr. Willimon has been involved in the church all of his life. He's one of those from the time he was a child, since before he was developing memory. He's also been ordained clergy all of his adult life. He's in his 70s now, and he still has speaking engagements, and he's still teaching, and he's still obviously writing books. But at some point, this man's going to retire. And I believe he is just as frustrated as he can possibly be for the lack of movement in mainline Protestant denominations, including the United Methodist Church, which is where his heart is in his lifetime for all the work this man has done, we've lost ground, and plenty of it. And Willimon understands what needs to be done. And it is what Jesus has called his disciples to from the very beginning. But in so many ways, it's not happening. Not the way it needs to. And I think that Willimon fears for the church I think he fears for us, and I think he's losing his patience. And I want to give you an example of that that's in the book. The scripture we just heard read, that is a part of this chapter. I give you a new commandment, love each other, just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. Immediately after that, Willimon writes, 
The Apostle John's frequent, boringly repetitive, love each other, clearly meaning the person next to you at the Lord's table, makes me think that maybe John sometimes served a United Methodist Church. <laughs> Ouch! Ouch! But darn it, I understand his point. You know, our faith journey is not completed in learning to love those around us, right? Genuinely loving those around us, that's a really good thing and it's important, but that's not reaching the goal. <laughs> that's just the first step. And sometimes I think, we think, if we could just love everybody in the church, then ought, that ought to do it. That ought to be good enough, right? But according to our scripture, that's step one. And let's face it, some of us struggle just to get along with other people in the church. Willeman writes, Church is where if we're doing our job, we meet Christ, whose main work is accomplished not by healing and helping, but rather vocation. Christ helps and heals by giving us outrageous assignments, insisting that, one, we feel someone else's pain greater than our own. We feel someone else's pain greater than our own. Two, we take responsibility for someone who is not in our family. And three, we welcome strangers as we have been welcomed. We all are on a faith journey. And one of the ways I commonly describe this as is, uh, we're walking with God and toward God at the same time through this life, and we never fully arrive in this life. At least we're, in, we're invited to this walk, and I think probably most all of us are on it. And we need to keep moving. There are, there are folks who, authors who will claim that if you're not moving forward in your faith journey, you're actually moving backwards. And I don't know if I agree with that, but I do think it's worth paying attention to. See, if we get to a place in our faith journey where we think we've arrived, where we're comfortable with what we know, right? I mean, I've talked to some folks who, who have said, I, I have had so much more Bible study than my friends. I'm done. <laughs> like, well, if we are comfortable with who we know. We've got our group. They understand me. We all kind of think alike. That feels pretty good. Or we simply think we've gone far enough, or we've done enough, or darn it, it's somebody else's turn. <laughs> and we stop moving forward in our faith journey. When we stop walking with God and toward God in a purposeful way, do you know what happens? That's when things begin to sour. That's when we begin to stagnate. And that's a problem. That's a really big problem because, because we are the church. We are the church. Willeman writes, church is not where we get what we want out of God. Church is God's means for getting what God wants out of us, right? So there may be times in our faith journey that we slow down. Maybe we have to, you know, and that's, that's okay for a moment. But we need to keep moving. We need to always keep moving forward. There may be times we speed up. Have you ever had a quantum leap on your faith journey? It's like, oh my gosh, I never thought about it like that before. Never. It's like somebody's just turned up a dimmer switch and the lights have come up and you, you understand things in a way you didn't before and it is amazing and it just makes you want to learn more. Now I'm sure some of you have had that kind of a BAM! I never thought about it like that before. But those times are really rare. We would get spoiled if they happened too often. Now, Three giant steps forward in your faith journey, that's something you can do. That's something that we can do on a pretty regular basis. When was the last time you felt like that? You know, that three giant steps forward. Wow, I 
Never thought about it like that before. Wow. Something will always be new and changed and different in me now. Wow. See, I would imagine that for many of us, the last time we felt like that, we were probably in a class. We were probably in a class. We might not be in the class when we have the experience, but we're probably in a class learning something that we're unfamiliar with that maybe challenges us and with people we don't know yet. I think so often those quantum leaps, those three giant steps forward in our faith, I think those are often a reward for taking a risk and being open. So if you're at a place where you could use a, a jump start kind of on your faith journey, if you're thinking, I'm not sure what happened, but I, I don't know if I have moved forward much recently. I actually think one of the very best ways to get yourself moving again is to learn something new with people you don't know. I think something like this, the classes that are listed in this book, is, it's, like, um, it's like a key to moving forward in your faith journey. One of the best ways to get moving again, and the nice thing is, is that we can do that right here in this church. You can take a class that challenges you and not know another person in that classroom. This church is big enough that you can do that right here. So when was the last time you felt nudged? You know, when was the last time you felt something nipping at your heels or whispering to you? And I am talking about the Holy Spirit here. When was the last time you felt like you were being drawn to something fresh and different and something challenging in your faith and your sense is like, oh, I want to, oh, but I'm afraid. Oh, I want to, but oh, I don't have enough time. When was the last time you felt like that? Maybe today? Maybe today? Maybe it's happening right now? You need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. That is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit knows God isn't done with you. And God is not done with the church. Thanks be to God. Amen.